that I'm feeling have a very different shape to mine, so uh, uh, I beg forgiveness for that. But I, I think your feet may fit better at the end of the programme than the original <laughs> shoes did. So. than where I'm sitting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, my, my, my Timberland Vibram soles. Um, so here's an outline of what I'd like to cover, if time permits. Um, although the title is forward-looking, there is actually quite a lot of backward looking, I mean, notably in the book, where um, uh, the, our, our strongest historical <coughs> focus is precisely on the period in between Hannah's and Jeremy's papers, and we have a great deal to say about the 1753 Act, which is, the, in one sense, the foundation of everything that we say in that book. So um, I'm going to use that history to establish my second bullet point, which looks very blunt and in your face in the way I'm presenting it here, but I will be less blunt when I get on to the more detailed exposition. I'm going to talk about recent UK legislative history with particular focus on the House of Lords, on the matters of the Bishops and Civil Partnerships, the <coughs> Ali Amendment, which I shall explain to those that haven't heard of it, and the Deer motion, so that everybody knows what I'm talking about. That was the motion that the same-sex marriage bill, when it arrived from the Commons, be not heard, that it not be given a second reading. Uh, I then go on to consider the recent Pilling report and how, how it should or should not or may or may not form a response from the Church of England to these events in the state. And I round off with a case, cases for and against continuing establishment in the light of these developments. So there's the book which Charlotte has already mentioned. Copies still available on the shelf there <laughs> at a 25% discount, <laughs> 15 pounds. Okay, so... It's quite obvious that religious freedom and same-sex marriage have had, not only in England and Wales, but in many, many jurisdictions, they have had a very rocky relationship recently. Because there are many religions and many groups within religions who think that the idea of same-sex marriage is abhorrent on theolog theological grounds, whatever their different theologies may be, and as we all know, this applies not only to Christian theologies. So I'm here quoting from an official Church of England statement to the UK government's consultation on a proposal to introduce same -sex, same, civil same-sex marriage in England and Wales. Notice that the recent now Act covers only England and Wales. Mm -hmm. And if I had a shilling for every time somebody mentions Britain when they mean England and Wales, I would be a rich man. Uh, but it wouldn't be legal tender. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here, here, here's, the, here's the Church of England official statement in, relation, uh, in response to the government white paper. Uh, notice that it's stating the Church of England cannot support the proposal to enable, quote, all couples, regardless of their gender, to have a civil marriage ceremony. The phrase in quotes is the government proposal. So notice straight away, in the context of the discussion we've been having all afternoon, I'm sorry I wasn't here in the morning, uh, that this is already, I would say, smuggling in a claim that uh, the church has, in some sense, a control over what the state does in this area. The, at, at the time, I'm going to come later to why the proposal was changed, but at the time the proposal was civil marriage only. So one might say... Was it any business of the Church of England? I'm not going to answer that question. I'm just going to leave it hanging in the air. But the Church of England, on what I can, I'm perfectly content to call religious freedom grounds, was arguing then that there's some sense in which the state's taking this step. Maybe it's like marriage to deceased wife's sister, which I'm glad that Jeremy mentioned. I'm, going to, I'm possibly going to come on to it as well. Is pulling further away, <laughs> and that that is seen quite clearly. It is seen by some people in the Church of England as as a threat to religious freedom, or is it just a threat to religious establishment? Perhaps that's a different thing. <laughs> At any rate, that is, that was the that was the statement. Notice, I, I won't pick up intrinsic nature of marriage as the union of man and woman as enshrined in human institutions throughout history. We had a a, a very gentle reminder from Hannah at the start of the afternoon that it's more complicated than that. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. I also am not going to talk about the private member's motion. What I want now to draw attention to is the religious, and I stress even putting it in red, religious arguments on the other side. Um, the 
Quakers, Religious Society of Friends, uh, decided in 2009 at its, I'll say our, yearly meeting in York to embrace same-sex Quaker marriage. Uh, I wasn't there, so it is, this is hearsay, but um, one thing that is relevant is that, as many of you will know, uh, the Quaker decision procedure is not based on majority voting. It is based on coming to unity in the light. And you could, from outside, call it some sort of unanimity rule, but Quakers don't proceed unless they feel that they are in unity on some proposition. So I think the fact that Quakers came to unity on same-sex marriage in 2009 deserves <coughs> respect and more respect than it, than it has received in certain quarters, as I'm about to go on to say. Uh, now, our reasons... I'm not a theologian, and I'm not qualified to talk about theology, but I'll give you my understanding of the Quaker theology that lies behind this statement from George Fox, which is in our Book of Discipline. It's, at the, it's the first uh, entry in the chapter on marriage. The first bit of it, I believe, is standard radical Reformation theology, shared with the Baptists, shared with uh, Congregationalists. The right joining of mar in marriage is the work of the Lord only, and not the priests or magistrates. It's a strongly anti-establishment statement as well as much else. For it, marriage, is God's ordinance and not man's, and therefore friends cannot consent that they should join them together, that is, that priests or magistrates could, should conduct Quaker marriages. And this was what spoke to us in, in, in 2009, the last bit. For we marry none, it is the Lord's work, and we are but witnesses. And Quakers were led in unity to the belief that we were witnessing uh, the Lord's work in same-sex um, marriages as we were in opposite-sex marriages in our meetings. Uh, for their different theologies, uh, Unitarians and Liberal Judaism reached the same point and re since 2009 Reform Judaism has joined us. So we were uh, three musketeers, now <laughs> four. Uh, we were always going with, with Unitarians and Danny Rich of Liberal Judaism to, to government meetings. So this you know, here we stand, and we do so for reasons of what I would call radical 17th century theology. Now, here I'm going to be slightly more nuanced than I was in my, in my headline, but in a way which has been developing during the afternoon. Um, uh, we, in the book, we quote C.S. Lewis writing back in 1961, writing indeed at the precise time when he had contracted what some people rather unkindly call a marriage of convenience with uh, Joy Davidman, um, but writing in a way which we find is quite persuasive to say that there is something called marriage and there is something called holy matrimony and a lot of confusion arises out of confusing the two, uh, and that it is for the, for the church to decide what constitutes holy matrimony and it is for the state to decide what constitutes marriage. Now, some of you may feel this is a dangerous road to even start to go down, but conceptually, it seems to us that Lewis is entirely right. And we come to that conclusion partly through our detailed study, which is in the book of the 1753 Act. I don't need to say as much about this as I do in any other forum in which I speak, because you've already heard quite a lot about it. Uh, it's, we have studied the parliamentary debates, we have studied the papers of Lord Hardwick, who is the promoter of the bill, and there's not a scintilla of discussion on either side in, in, in Parliament, on either House of Parliament, uh, on, of, for any religious ground for regulating marriage in the particular way. The grounds were entirely to do with property and succession. They were entirely to do um, with the matters that Jeremy mentioned, with irregular fleet marriages going on in London, and uh, therefore uh, the state didn't know whether people were married or not, and um, estates were at risk of being disposed of in irregular ways. So, I mean, you only need to think, uh, we had Thomas Hardy, it must be in everybody's mind. Uh, it was certainly in mine, and you must come across it every week. Um, uh, the um, the um, Jane Eyre moment must be in everybody's mind every time any of you says, if any man know any reason, etc. Uh, well, of course, that's been there since before 1753, but it is there for a reason in which the state purposes of the state and the church are, at that matter, parallel. So, the 1753 <laughs> Act was entirely about social control of property and succession. It didn't affect the poor because the poor didn't have any property. Uh, but the three exemptions are 
uh, the exceptions are vitally important for understanding where we are now more than 250 years ago. As you've already heard, Quakers and Jews are specifically exempted from the operation <coughs> of the Act. Um, now, in one, from the state's point of view, this was a safe <coughs> concession because it, Quakers only married other Quakers, Jews only married other Jews. You could tell a Quaker or a Jew in the street. You didn't have a problem of people pretending, to, or it was not thought that there was a problem of people pretending to be Quakers or Jews in order to avoid, to evade the rules. Quakers had, for the first <coughs> hundred years of Quakerism, been refusing for the reasons given by George Fox to be married in parish churches, which had given those who had property disputes with Quakers the opportunity to say, you yeah, know, this couple are not married and therefore um, their children are bastards and therefore I, a distant cousin, am entitled to the property. This had, in fact, was on the way to being resolved in common law actually in favour of the Quakers. Uh, judges were coming to see that, um, uh, uh, in the words of one which is quoted in our, in our Book of Discipline, that the Quakers do not come together as brute beasts. Mm -hmm. So there was some recognition in the legal system that uh, this was, this, albeit involving a refusal to be married in the parish church, was, was, was nevertheless to be protected. But, you know, judicial court, individual judges, uh, not a very reliable protection. So it's extremely important in Quakerism and to Quakers that we have, present tense, the exemption conferred in 1753. Uh, and we have it to this day. So uh, Quaker weddings, um, many of you will know this, uh, Quaker weddings are carried out <coughs> with no involvement by the state at all, uh, as are Jewish weddings. Uh, the, uh, in the Quaker case, the, um, the Quaker registrar see that the, the wedding is in right ordering for women and our procedures for ensuring that are quite elaborate and then it keeps a, a book which is as, as it gets fooled it's, 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 it's sent to the, the civil registrar. So our position was different to that of the nonconformists and Catholics and still is different. So you heard in the previous session about 1836 um, the, only then did um, dissenters and Catholics and other groups and the, and the rights to conduct their own marriages in their own way. And even then, they have to have a relationship with the state, which is different to that of the Quakers and the Jews. Uh, they have to be, you know, the minister or priest has to be licensed to have a double function as a civil registrar. It's not automatic, as it is for CV clergy, for um, Quaker registering offices and for uh, synagogue secretaries. And that pattern continues with the recent Act. Um, the one reason it's such a long Act is that the provisions for Quakers and Jews who may wish to um, conduct same-sex marriages are different, uh, not only to the provisions for the CV, but also the provisions for other, um, other religions. Once uh, the state got involved, the question of conscientious objection came up. And Again, I'm glad that I don't have to repeat what in this room what I would have to repeat anywhere else where I give this talk. Um, but those of you who, whose only acquaintance with this first issue was the line in Iolanthe, where, the, as you know, the fairy queen sends Strephon to rule the unruly House of Lords. He shall prick that amnil blister marriage with deceased wife's sister. <laughs> uh, so a conscientious <coughs> objection is in the 1907 Act. Uh, for a clergyman who might otherwise be required to marry parishioners, they have the conscientious rights to opt out. This has served as a model for later uh, uh, changes in the civil law and divorce, and now uh, in a slightly different form for same-sex marriage. So, uh, and indeed, the, uh, the conscientious the government talked a lot, so much about the quadruple lock that the Secretary of State started abbreviating and calling it the quad lock, which was negotiated with religious bodies, um, and as Scott and I have observed, it's a door which only opens from one side. Um, as you will know, if a denomination says no, an individual minister cannot in conscience say yes. If a denomination says yes, however, an individual minister can in conscience say no. So there is an asymmetrical protection of conscience, but there is a protection of conscience in the recent act. Um, this here is my attempt to explain part, I think, why there is so much 
anger and resentment in certain religious circles over what has happened in the last year and a bit. Um, and uh, it is, as I'm sure most of you know, when the government issued a white paper in 2012, it said that the provision that we're making for same-sex marriage is to be civil only. <coughs> no religion will be permitted to offer same-sex marriages. When the bill came out, clearly to the horror of many religious organizations, they had shifted their ground and they had introduced the opt-in proposals, which are now law. Why? I think I have the answer. Uh, and the answer lies in Europe, which I put in scare quotes, because people who don't like Europe uh, don't often care to distinguish between the European Court of Justice of the European Union and the European Court of Human Rights of the Council of Europe, and it's the latter that is relevant here. Now, uh, you may have, there has been a great deal of fuss and bother in conservative circles that uh, Europe here deems to be a bad thing would force unwilling clergy to conduct same-sex marriage, that people would take human rights cases, that gay couples would turn up at their parish church, for instance, uh, for the sole purpose of um, embarrassing the Church of England and or the local vicar, and when faced with the inevitable refusal to be married, they would trot off to Strasbourg. Um, we think, and so does every qualified lawyer, bar one, who's looked at this, that this is an unimaginably remote prospect. The, uh, the Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights, protecting freedom of religion, uh, I think gives the Church of England, the Catholic Church, any other church which does not want to conduct same-sex marriage, as far as we can see, cast iron protection. If people are not certain about that, we could perhaps talk about it later. What I want to draw attention to here is the case on the other side, which got no publicity at all. And it's this, that the government's 2012 proposals to allow civil same-sex marriage only and forbid religions from taking part gave rise to a religious conscience issue on the opposite side. And that was that it would have come from Quakers or Jews or both, that we are, as I've just explained, agents of the state, and the state gave us that delegation back in 1753. Um, and to simultaneously introduce a change of marriage law and not permit those who in conscience wanted to do it in their meeting houses and synagogues, that would be a violation of Article 9 and other articles. And we, I mean, not that ever any threat was ever mentioned in any meeting that I went to. This was, this was government lawyers thinking about through the issues before we ever said them. Um, uh, we would have gone to the domestic courts who would have interpreted this, the Strasbourg law and who would have, we believe, said, there's a very strong likelihood that the domestic courts would have said, if you institute a civil marriage regime and you allow certain religions to conduct opposite-sex marriages, uh, then it's discriminatory and contrary to Article 9 and other articles to forbid them from conducting religious same-sex <coughs> marriages. Uh, a, curiosi a curiosity within a curiosity here, then, is that the position of the Unitarians is more ambiguous. In the early 19th century, as Jeremy came close to saying, Unitarians were regarded as much more dangerous than Quakers or Jews <laughs> because you knew what a Quaker or a Jew looked like and they only <coughs> knew one another. A Unitarian looked like anybody else and they didn't believe in the Trinity and that was thought to have all sorts of dangerous social consequences. So the state was, in, in, in the period that Jeremy was talking about, was much more reluctant to give marriage rights to Unitarians than to Quakers or Jews, but it, now it has. I want now to go back to the recent past since civil partnerships were introduced and looking at the legislature because it's my, my, my day job. So civil partnerships were introduced by the Blair Labour government in 2004 and when they first reached the House of Lords the then Bishop of Winchester was one of the sponsors of a wrecking amendment and it's important when one uses emotive language to say that that wrecking is not my word. It's the word of a church house official who wrote a narrative history of the, of the history of civil partnerships. Um, this was the amendment to say that um, siblings living together should have access to these. Um, and that might be thought to be harmless. It might indeed be thought to be a good thing. But um, we know from the, mo from the admitted motives of those who did it that it was done not in order to get a better legal status for siblings living together, but in order to make the passage of civil partnerships for same-sex couples more difficult. Because 
if you, from nowhere, in the Lords, introduced an amendment to a civil partnerships bill saying that, among others, siblings living together can have uh, this right, that is giving tax privileges. In other words, it is potentially reducing the tax yield by hundreds of millions of pounds. Uh, and therefore, uh, I'm sure the then Bishop of Winchester and his co-sponsor knew that there was no chance of this being adopted in the, in the Commons, as indeed it was not, it was thrown out by the Commons. So when the bill came back to the Lords, although there was a, there was, there was a, spot, a, a move to reinsert the, it was called the O'Cahoyne among them, who was the Bishop of Winchester's co-sponsor, which was supported by one bishop, I think the Bishop of Chester, the other bishops let it pass. In other words, they did, they did not attempt to insist on their earlier amendments. And it is that, and only that, <laughs> in my view, that allows uh, official C of E sources to make the claim that uh, the bishops were in favour of civil partnerships. I'm afraid, I think that is an extremely disingenuous claim. I will not use any stronger language than that. Um, in 2010, the Equality Bill, which is now the Equality Act, was before Parliament. This was, as you will know, a, a, a bill now an act to bring together the various strands of equality legislation into a single act. Um, and uh, it's inevitably because uh, gender rights and rights of sexual minorities, rights of ethnic minorities, and rights of religious minorities or religious groups are all in that. The conflict, which has always been there between um, anti-discrimination claims by, for instance, excuse me, sexual minorities and claims to protection of religious doctrine, there's always been a potential clash, but putting it all in a single bill accentuates the clash. And there was a dispute over how wide should be, the Americans have the useful phrase, the ministerial exemption. Uh, no, no reasonable person um, could, if you think about it for five seconds, you, you couldn't possibly insist that equality legislation applies with full force to all religions. Mm -hmm. That would have the effect of forcing, say, the Catholic Church to accept female priests. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a ministerial exemption. The question, the disputed question is how wide. Mm -hmm. I'm not going into that issue substantively, just to say it, the boundaries of the ministerial exemption going into the bill were this. The Labour government proposed to reduce them slightly to that. And uh, the bishops, um, in a very rare instance, were decisive. That's to say, uh, a government, uh, mo uh, a, a, a section of the bill was defeated in the Lords by the bishops uh, being decisive. Eight bishops voted, and one of the uh, government defeats was carried by only five mm -hmm. uh, to keep the scope of the ministerial exemption that rather than that in size. I'm describing it very informally. Uh, and so, and it was March of 2010, the general election was coming up, there was no chance for the Commons, there was no time for the Commons to reinsist, reinsert the original scope, sorry, the original narrowed scope for ministerial exemption. So the bishops can be decisive, and they were on this occasion. Uh, at the same time, and it's important to understand that this was exactly the same time, it was the winter and spring of 2010, the Labour peer, Lord Alley, was offering an amendment to the same bill uh, which would permit civil partnerships to take place in religious premises for those religions that wanted to do them. When initially introduced, civil partnerships where the name was what it said on the tin, they were only permitted to have to take place with no religious language and not on religious premises. For the same reasons of conscience as in the more recent um, occasion, Quakers and others were saying this was a violation of our rights of conscience, or our claims of conscience, uh, and under pressure, well, not under pressure, it was an autonomous move by Lord Alley, but once introduced, Quakers, the usual suspects, Quakers, Unitarians, and Liberal Judaism were very much in favour of the Alley Amendment. Uh, some people were very much against it, and there's the list, I mean, when, when it came up for debate, one bishop spoke in favour, two spoke against, and the one that... I, I'm afraid I cannot refrain from being slightly ranty at this point. The same Bishop of Winchester, the then Bishop of Winchester, Michael Scott Joint, who had um, uh, sponsored the Wrecking Amendment on civil partnerships six years earlier, stood up in the legislature, of which he is an ex officio member, and said what I quote there, churches of all sorts really should not reduce or fudge, let alone deny that distinction. 
Um, I, I don't know if it's easy to convey m my sense of total outrage. We, as yearly meeting of Religious Society of Friends, had by our Quaker decision-making procedure come to the view that we had by that time come to. Who did this guy think he was? By what right? And so I got into a public, well, a semi-public uh, uh, discussion with, with Bishop Scott Joint, where I used the, I have to confess, I used the ultimate weapon in uh, quickly writing, I, my sentence began, friend, by what right do you feel you are entitled to make that distinction? And it's fair to say he replied, he didn't reply in public, but he, he gave me a slightly temporising reply. Despite the efforts of the bishops of uh, Bradford and Winton, uh, the Alley Amendment was carried, to my actual astonishment, it was carried by 95 votes to 21 in the laws. And this was the first symbol that I got that the attitudes of the House of Lords was very different to what it had been only six years earlier on, on thermal mm -hmm. partnership, only ten years earlier on, on Section 28. There was nevertheless an attempt to, by what I have to describe as a backdoor manoeuvre, to annul the Alley Amendment in 2011, led by the same Baroness O'Cohoin who had sponsored in 2004. One bishop spoke on each side. And that, that attempt, I was in the House throughout that, that was withdrawn without a vote. And this is my take-home point. We hear statements from Church House and from various bishops, and it's in the Pilling Report, saying we have always supported civil partnerships. I'm going to try to speak moderately. I think it's just incredible it's for people online. to say this, where, when anybody who has access to online Hansard can go through the record that I've just gone through. I've heard Charlotte using a stronger word than I'm using <laughs> in my presentation. And I would stand to it. So now we come to the recent act, the recent bill. It arrived in the House of Lords, having been carried by the Commons in the, with the majority stated, um, over two to one. And it, it was met in the Lords by a highly unusual move. It's highly unusual for the Lords to <coughs> hear a motion that something be denied a second reading. In fact, the closest historical parallel is the Lords' rejection of the budget in 1909. And that ended badly from the point of view of the Lords. Uh, so it was, an, it was not an amendment to oppose the principle of the bill. It was an amendment that there be no further discussion of the bill. Bear that in mind. I'm, some of you, I'm sure, already know this. Um, the Archbishop of Canterbury made what I think was a good speech, saying this was an unwise motion. And I think he's absolutely right. Then, to my total incomprehension, he voted in favour of it, as did eight other bishops. Five abstained none voted against. The five who abstained included the convener of the bishop's uh, bench, the, the Bishop of Leicester. Notice that if that motion had been successful, two things would have followed. Firstly, it would have terminated any discussion in the Lords of the various forms of conscientious objection and protection for conscience, which various religious groups had been proposing. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it would have been futile because the Commons would have insisted on it under the Parliament Act. If the Lords reject a bill without without even discussing it, the Commons grounds for reintroducing it and insisting on it under the Parliament Act become even stronger, and the bill was proposed as early as it was in the life of the present uh, coalition government, in the knowledge that if there was any difficulty from the Lords, there would be time to use the Parliament Act before the dissolution in 2015. And I'm quite confident that if the Lords had rejected the bill, uh, the Commons would have insisted on it in the session that we're now in, and it would have carried under the Parliament Act without Lord's consent. In other words, there might have been no Lord's discussion of, conscien of protections of conscience at all. Therefore, I'm quite forthright in saying that the Deer Amendment was a missiological disaster. Uh, first of all, it led to, it was rejected by that enormous majority in the Lords, larger than the majority in the, in the Commons, and it showed what a bad strategist Lord Deere was, because that 390, we're certain, includes a lot of people who were not particularly sympathetic to the cause of same-sex marriage, but who thought that the Lords, which boasts of its prowess as a revising chamber, whatever else it does, it should not decline to revise or to consider revisions to a bill. But that 390 to 148 knocked the stuffing out of the opposition to the bill, and there were no further substantive votes as it went through the Lords. I think it's important, since I'm talking so much about conscience, to observe that the Deere Amendment damaged the conscience of people on both sides. Obviously it damaged the consciences of people like us, but it also damaged the consciences of religious conservatives for the reasons that I've just given, that people who say you need to have a proper discussion of protection of conscience 
if the Deere Amendment had been carried, and the Archbishop of Canterbury voted for it, uh, would not have had that opportunity for discussion. That seems to be just seriously, seriously perverse. And as I say, it raises serious questions about the continuing role of the bishops in the Lords. I think some parties may have expulsion of the bishops in their next election manifestos. And I can only speculate, but this is more for you than for me, that this trouble was caused by the bishops looking over their shoulder at some what I regard as inappropriate groups. Uh, so, inappropriate. You know, well, that's I. I uh, sorry, I went. I went too far there. I, uh, uh, some inter, some internal. I mean, you know, international issues are another matter which 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 merit serious discussion. So now we have the Pilling report, which, as as you will know, has been a long time in the making, um, and it is relevant to say that it was it was in the making before this the bill even reached Parliament. Um, and it says what I think is a very true thing at paragraph 83. Furthermore, uh, it has, as you all know, been fiercely criticised from both sides. I take the Archbishop of Uganda and changing attitude as representatives of a great volume of criticisms that come at from both sides. It's common for a, some, a retired civil servant like Sir Joseph Billing to, and not, I'm not attributing this to him personally, but a civil servant might say, if you're fiercely attacked from both sides, you must have it about right. <laughs> Unfortunately, I cannot say that for this report. In fact, um, and I'm, I'm not qualified to and will not say anything about the theology in the Pilling Report, but I'm a social scientist. I look at his handling of social science, and it's terrible. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I, yeah, I, told, uh, I mentioned that to some people here that, that I, for my sins, am sitting on the, what academics will know, the REF panel for my subject, politics. So I've got to spend the next year grading um, academic papers in, in political science from zero to four. Using REF criteria, Pilling would get a zero. And some of the reasons I are, are in my bullet points here. First of all, right from the very get-go, it talks about Christian lives lived with same-sex attraction, as if same-sex attraction is some sort of disabling condition. Uh, but same-sex attraction is not an illness. I know there are those who still think it to be, but those whose job is professionally to treat these matters don't think of it as an illness. And the, 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 sorry, but the rotten core, I'm not the only one to have said this, but I feel this very strongly, is in Paragraph 206 to 207. In Paragraph 206, the Pilling and his colleagues summarise the evidence they've received from the Royal College of Psychiatrists. In Paragraph 207, they say to the effect, on the other hand, we've had a submission from the Core Issues Trust, which says the opposite. To equate the professional body um, who are responsible for treating mm -hmm. mental illness with a lobby group which fervently believes, and which is entitled to believe, that it is, among other things, I understand the Core Issues Trust believes that under some circumstances it's possible to turn gay people straight, and they have anecdotal evidence to support that. Mm -hmm. But to equate those is to simply fail to understand what evidence is. Mm -hmm. Um, and on the same subject, uh, in Para 199, they give some anecdotes about you know, individuals who testify, uh, and I'm not doubting the genuineness of the testimony, that they have been able to um, suppress unwanted same-sex attraction. But anecdotes are one thing, and statistics are another. The statistical evidence is quite clear across a range of social science subjects. And I'll just give you a reference, and in fact, um, I've got a, a footnote and I can show it to anybody. Uh, these matters have been tested in a court. Courts are where you test the quality of evidence. And in the U.S. District Court for San Francisco, all the same claims were made uh, by those opposed, in that case, to uh, who wish to maintain um, Proposition 8, which was um, a constitutional ban in California on same-sex marriage. And those claims were found by the trial judge to be entirely baseless when he compared them with the evidence. Furthermore, this is relatively minor, but it's really rather surprising. The paragraphs 159 to 73 of Pilling talk about survey evidence on what Christians, and specifically Anglicans, think about same-sex marriage. For some incomprehensible reason, it takes a survey from 10 years ago, but this is a matter on which we know that opinion is moving very fast. Uh, the same question is asked every year by British Social Attitudes. And in case people weren't already aware, um, Christians are roughly evenly divided, Anglicans are roughly evenly divided, about 50-50, in favour and against. And it seems to me the Archbishop, who is quoted twice in Pilling, has got a much 
better understanding of the gravity of the situation than the Pilling Committee. Uh, there's that, that, that quotation speaks for itself, and I think he's entirely right in his observation. And so does that. I think he's entirely right in that observation as well. So, I'm just... I'm, I'm sure you've seen both of these quotes, so I've, I've, I've passed over them rather quickly and I'm running out of time. And yet, we go to Pilling, and the report, remember, is more recent than either of those statements for the, by the Archbishop, which were made in the summer of 2013. In December 2013, Pilling comes out with this action paragraph. Higher standards of conduct from the currently and for laity, and indeed higher standards from his bishops than from the clergy. <laughs> And uh, then we, you, are to have two years of facilitated conversations on this subject. Um, if it's, I'm sure it has already occurred to most people in this room, but it, we are now only uh, uh, two months away from the first same-sex marriages. It will be open for clergy as much as for anybody else to be married to their same-sex partner, to contract a religious marriage to their same-sex partner in a Unitarian chapel, and if they're in unity with the testimony of friends to conduct it, to uh, um, contract such a marriage in a friend's meeting house. And th this will be a fact on the ground which will be there before the facilitated conversations even start. Now, is, is a clergyman or woman who has been married to the, his or her same-sex partner who two husbands, let's say for the sake of argument, both clergy, or two wives, both clergy, um, how would this paragraph of Pilling be applied to them? I just can't begin to understand. Uh, I'll, I'll leave the question in the air. So I think all that I've been saying is facing the Church of England with quite a stark choice. And I'm putting it in its starkest possible terms to facilitate debate. Establishment versus the right to discriminate. Uh, establishment may be weakened in any case. I mean, the bishops may be uh, uh, expelled from the House of Lords because a party which says it will do that wins the next election. That's, I think, perfectly possible. Or they may decide that the time has come to go. <coughs> That's less likely, but it might happen. Uh, but establishment is more than the bishops and the lords. The Church of Scotland is established. Some of its own officials disagree with that, but I, <laughs> I insist that it is established. The word established is in the Act of Union. Uh, and it has the same conception of mission as the Church of England has, to be a national church. And you can do that without having bishops in the legislature. So you could have an established church without, without bishops and the lords. Uh, for sure, the zone within which you can discriminate will not be allowed to expand, and it might, it might contract, because after all, if you are the state church, the state has got some. Uh, think the state may think that there's some right to set the rules. This emerged, and it may yet emerge again, over women bishops. And many people don't like it in the church, but it is defensively a consequence of being a state church. Uh, I think my final point is self-explanatory. It was said by the archbishop, and I can only endorse it. Disestablishment brings more religious freedom, and by, this is where my personal preference lies. Um, the, US, the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, as you will all know, says Congress shall make no law <coughs> respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That comes from the history of what in England we call dissenting sects in, in the United States up to in the two centuries leading up to that. And I could talk at whatever length you wanted, but I know more than you want about um, religious freedom in Virginia, which was the crucible of it. Um, and so I'm a great fan of the First Amendment. It would give the Church of England the unfettered right to determine its own sex, sexual, its own attitudes to sex, human sexuality in its own way. Uh, and if it chose to do so in a continuing conservative way, it's, that would make attitudes, relationship with GAFCON and other um, external bodies easier. It would be a benefit that it would end the possibility of the Bishop of Winchester standing up and purporting to speak for Quakers and Jews when he's in, on the exact opposite side to Quakers and Jews. I'm sorry I bang on about the former Bishop of Winchester, <laughs> but I just want you to get the, the, an, an idea of the depth of feeling that Quaker have on this matter. Would disestablishment be disastrous to mission? Maybe it would. 
Um, and I'm afraid in a rather downbeat way, both of my last two slides end in the same way. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs>